What's up guys? So today's video is going to be on Eden Robinson's Trickster Trilogy. I actually kept hesitating to make this video because I was worried I wouldn't be able to do the books justice here. But these books have actually become one of my favorite series of all time, and so I wanted to talk to them, sorry, I wanted to talk about them, not to them, uh, a little bit today. I'll also be talking about the basic premise of this series and a couple things that stood out to me, while also trying to avoid major spoilers. The last book in this trilogy is called Return of the Trickster, and it was published this past March 2021. And I personally read it at the end of April. I also reread the second book in the series, which is called Trickster Drift, right before uh, reading Return of the Trickster, just as a bit of a refresher. I gave all three of these books five out of five stars. For me personally, these were very, very fast reads that I found difficult to put down. So for that reason, I recommend that if you start reading them now that they're all published, uh, it might actually be best to read them one after the other to get the full effect and so that you don't kind of forget anything in between. And honestly, that would be pretty easy to do as far as like reading them in order or one after the other because they are pretty short books, usually around 250 to 375 pages or so. As far as the author, uh, Eden Robinson is from Kitimat, BC, and a member of the Heisla First Nation and Heiltsuk First Nation. She has lived in Vancouver and Victoria as well. Jared, who is the main character of these books, is also from Kitimat. He's also a member of Heisla First Nation and eventually goes to university in Vancouver. So, as you can see, Robinson is writing about locations and territories that she herself is familiar with. So if you're trying to read more own voices books, this series should fit. This series is mostly single person POV and genre wise, I would call it a mix of general fiction and fantasy taking place in our own modern world, somewhere in the 2010s. I would also say a large chunk of these books um, also fall into slice of life in the sense that they're very character driven with a strong focus being on Jared's daily life and on him trying to pursue essentially a normal quiet life. The first book, Son of a Trickster, especially leans more towards general fiction or magical realism, uh, kind of that side of things. Son of a Trickster doesn't feature many supernatural or magical elements, so I wouldn't go in expecting that from the very first book. That's something that I did notice from Goodreads reviewers who gave it a lower rating. Um, they seem to have gone in expecting full-fledged fantasy or traditional urban fantasy from the get-go. but this really isn't traditional fantasy, and it doesn't immediately dive into fantasy plotlines, so I would recommend not going into it expecting that. I would say it's not until the second and third books uh, when you start to see the supernatural feature more heavily, including things like ghosts, interdimensional beings, shapeshifters, and other, actually other folkloric beings too, that I'll try not to mention here just in case it spoilers anything for anyone. Um, I know some people want the surprise of who will show up in there. From the back cover description of Son of a Trickster, you learn that at some point, Jared starts randomly hearing ravens talking to him, and that he's, he, um, he connects that phenomenon with the fact that he grew up with his maternal grandmother, um, who I should note is also a residential school survivor with a lot of her own traumas. But yeah, he uh, connects that with her believing he was Weget, uh, the trickster disguised as her grandson. So we don't learn too much about why that is or kind of uh, how that came to be right off the bat. But as the series goes on, we continue to learn more bits and pieces about Jared's family history, not only related to why she believes he's Weget, but the reasons behind many other realities of his life and his family's lives. I'll avoid explaining the main plot more beyond that just because it might head into spoiler territory. At the end of the day though, I find it hard to simplify the Trickster series into uh, this story is about XYZ type narr narrative just because they are such character driven books with a lot of depth to them beyond what might appear as the main story. Because this isn't just about what the back cover tells us, um, it's about so much more than that. I also find that the cover description on Son of a Trickster especially doesn't really do Jared justice as a character or really portray him accurately as a, as a, as a character. He definitely isn't a stereotypical high school burnout at all, which is what the cover description calls him. Uh, in reality, Jared is a pretty smart guy when it comes to school stuff. 
He's, um, like I mentioned before, really compassionate, and he's also pretty self-aware. He's definitely not someone who doesn't give a shit about school, and he's not a, a slacker either, which is usually what's kind of implied when you call somebody a burnout. Uh, even when he goes to university in Vancouver in the second book, he's doing it against his mother's own wishes, and he doesn't actually get a ton of support from her at first. He has to make this kind of thing happen for himself. Like I said before, chunks of these books do feel a bit slice of life in that they are focused on Jared's daily life and his pursuit of living a normal and quiet life. We aren't talking about a main character who wants to become a hero or who's looking for fame and fortune. Uh, he essentially just wants to live a quiet life, maybe one day own his own home, uh, start a family, and that kind of thing. Jared felt like a very genuine character for me. He's a smart guy, he's very compassionate, and his biggest flaw is also, I think, his biggest strength, at least the way I see it. He's a young guy who's still learning to balance his own well-being with his desire to avoid creating or re reawakening um, conflicts, worry, or harm for the people that he loves. Significant parts of the book are about navigating kind of difficult and complicated family relationships, intergenerational trauma, substance use, um, and sobriety for sure features heavily, even learning how to deal with predatory people while kind of balancing one's own well-being with the desire not to worry or harm loved ones. Navigating school, worries about financial stability, and those kinds of those kinds of things. I'd also mention here that this book does cover a ton of different important social and historical themes, but Robinson is very seamless about it and makes it feel more like the way these issues work their way into people's lives in the real world, rather than smacking you in the face with like, this is what, you know, this is about X issue, this is about Y issue. Like in the real world, these themes are embedded in characters' lives and experiences without Robinson having to put neon flashing lights around them. I especially appreciated the way Jared's maternal family members, like his mother, grandmother, and aunt, were written. Like real people, they all have heavy, they're all very, you know, heavily layered in their behaviors, their experiences, and their lives. So at this point, I want to kind of move into one of the things I really liked about this book. One of the things that made this series so powerful for me were the complicated family relationships and histories, how complicated expressing love can get within those dynamics, how love and family bonds can be transformed by feelings of fear, betrayal, um, anger, distrust, experiences of trauma, uh, and, and those sorts of things. Jared has a really strong relationship with his mother, and that was one of the things I loved most about these books. His parents divorced when he was a young kid, and I'd say that as a result, his mom developed, um, he and his mom kind of developed an even closer bond uh, than they might otherwise have done. In some ways, Jared's a bit of a, I would say like a bit of a mama's boy in some ways. He always wants to please his mother, will often do things um, that, are, that are detrimental to his own well-being to avoid angering her or hurting her in any way. Meanwhile, his mother will move mountains and won't hesitate for a second to, you know, kill, maim, otherwise injure, to protect Jared. In one scene that deals with Jared's childhood memories in the first book, his mother finds her white boyfriend at the time, who is very much, uh, we find, a controlling psychopath. She uh, finds him in Jared's room one night, kind of slowly, sadistically breaking his ribs. His mother's reaction is to staple gun him, uh, her boyfriend, to the floor. Uh, just as an example of the sorts of things uh, Maggie, who is his mother, will do uh, to protect Jared. Since his parents divorced, his mother has gone through a series of boyfriends, which is partially part of her own survival mechanism, and many of them aren't really great people. But as much as she's been willing to take shit in a relationship when she thinks that it'll benefit Jared or it's for Jared's sake and keeping a roof over his head, the minute anything is done to harm Jared, she would never, ever tolerate that. It would be a mistake for any man to underestimate her capacity for violence, that's for sure. Just to talk a little bit more about Jared and his mother's relationship, there are a couple times throughout these books when Jared's mom will stop talking to him, and it's actually because of the close bond that they have and the way that she interprets uh, what loyalty means. She'll see betrayals in even simple acts like Jared wanting to go to university, get sober, or to talk to family members that she wants nothing to do with because of personal histories. The bond comes with for her, I guess, the bond comes with the expectation that he will carry on her grudges uh, and, I guess, follow in her footsteps. And when he tries to do certain things for his own well-being, she can sometimes interpret that as him judging her or thinking that he's better with, better than her, but that's not 
the case. There's some great dialogue in the second book where Maggie, who is Jared's mom, says again to Jared over text, didn't mean to drive you away. You judge me and annoy me, but I thought I raised you different, but I still drove you away the way mom did me. Jared then replies, you didn't drive me away. I'm going to college. His mom texts back, you think that makes you better than me? And then Jared says, I think that means you raised a kid that's going to college. That's probably the most normal thing we've ever done. And Maggie then says, that's why it feels so wrong. And Jared, miss you, mom. And so I think that dialogue really shows the breaking down of Maggie's own fears that she's developed for legitimate reasons um, across her life, but that she's misdirected towards Jared. I think it's a moment that actually shows the strengthening of intergenerational relationships and understandings, and also just working through the messiness that that entails. Jared is very much a gentle soul, and he isn't really capable of being as intentionally brutal as his mother has had to be for the sake of his own survival. He has his own personal survival mechanisms, and as much as has happened to him over the course of his life, he thankfully hasn't had to resort to the kinds of things that his mother had to do to ensure her own safety and that of her son. And that's the thing. You could say that many times throughout Jared's life, his mother could have, in a simpler world, uh, in a simpler world, technically just asked for help from family members to avoid um, keeping shitty boyfriends around, as well as other problems that have happened. But her world and her family's history are really not simple at all. They're the farthest thing from simple, actually, as you read on. Her relationships with her mother, her sister, and other family members are very much fractured. And for legitimate reasons, for sure. And while this is technically not a book that is specifically about colonialism and genocide in Canada, the specter of that history and that ongoing reality hang over Maggie and they hang over Jared's life as well and their family. Maggie is in many ways carrying around not only her own life experiences and traumas, but those of her own mother and other family members before her. She is used to depending on herself and herself alone to solve her problems, and she stubbornly refuses to even talk to many of her family members. So when Jared starts to do so, uh, as well as do things that um, that she hasn't done for whatever reason, she, she starts to feel as though he's betraying her in some way. At his core, Jared also seems to have an innate desire to build and maintain his family relationships at all costs. One might say that that's kind of one of his superpowers, uh, along with his compassion, and sometimes uh, compassion to the point of his own detriment. But yeah, it's his ability to slowly, and in many cases inadvertently, bring his family members back together through his own propensity to fall victim to any number of predatory people and beings. His kind heart and selflessness often mean that he trusts too easily or he cares too little about his own personal well-being in the face of preserving other people's well-being. Despite how annoying he seems to come off to uh, many of his family members, his family are also instinctively inclined to close ranks around him, even if it means being in the same room as people they swore never to see or speak to again. I think some people may mistake this specifically as a coming-of-age story, but honestly, I didn't see it that way personally. There are some coming-of-age elements to it, depending on how you read certain plot lines and certain themes, but I think you miss a large part of what these books have to offer by sticking it into that category or limiting it to that category. I would say even its main themes are, are not necessarily coming-of-age themes. Anyways, that is kind of my overview and a little bit of thoughts about the Trickster Trilogy by Eden Robinson. Uh, I would also say too, if you're doing this year's 2021-2022 r slash fantasy book bingo, I will say that the third book, Return of the Trickster, could probably fit into a few squares on this year's card, including the Witches Square, Published in 2021 Square, and Chapter Title Square. Anyways, that's it for today. I hope I did this series justice. Um, not sure that I necessarily did, but it is a really great series, and I definitely recommend it. Thanks for watching today, and I'll see you next time.